Hi, I'm James Kettle, and this is the Sirens of Audio. Message from Cyber Control. You must subscribe to the Sirens of Audio on YouTube today, or you will be deleted. G'day audiophiles, this is the Sirens of Audio, the show that explores Doctor Who and the audio medium. I'm Dwayne. And I'm Philip. G'day Dwayne, g'day audiophiles. It's lovely to see your smiling face again, Philip. Oh, I know. It's always lovely to see you too, Dwayne. <laughs> it is that time of the month again. You know what time it is? It is no. time for... We've got randomoids. Ah! Yes. It's Randomoids time again, and last time we selected a story from the TARDIS cookie jar, and I remember who it was selected by, I remembered at the time, and I still do now. It was Roddy McDougall, a long-time fan of the show, so thanks, Roddy. This has been an absolute joy for both myself and Philip to go and revisit. Uh, being a new, sort of a newish release, if you've been a long-term Big Finish fan, I've, I'd only heard this once before, but I remembered that I enjoyed it immensely the first time and i knew i was going to enjoy it again and uh, it's going to be great to talk with you about it philip in a minute it is it's actually my third listen because i did, i did enjoy it so much i listened to it actually not that long ago probably nine twelve months ago okay excellent all right we'll talk about that in a moment but first do you know what well i want to know what theme we're <laughs> going to have more than anything else <laughs> it's what do you mean what theme it's <laughs> the rabbit hole theme and it's time to jump right in here we go There you go, Will Hadcroft. That was for you, mate. Um, <laughs> he couldn't handle it. Two uh, others couldn't handle it either. I don't know. They can't handle change, Dwayne. Now, we are recording this a few days prior to the screening of New Doctor Who on television, The Power of the Doctor. The final 13th Doctor episode is uh, screening in a few days. But by the time is you this, hear this... Where's it on? It's uh, on Sunday, this coming oh, Sunday. really? <laughs> there you go. I didn't even know it was on then. <laughs> Uh, Excellent. Yeah, we've just got so much audio to listen to. We can't keep our finger on the pulse of uh, real Doctor Who. Is that what we call it? No. No. That's what oh, I call televised it. Doctor Who. <laughs> televised. All right. Uh, we've got some real audio Doctor Who to talk about soon. But I want to talk a little bit about this uh, coming up because uh, we've we've got the Tenth Doctor and Donna, or David Tennant and Catherine Tate appearing in a forthcoming special there's rumors flying all over the place as to whether it's going to be this christmas or uh sometime next year or there's going to be a few different specials i don't know what the what the current theory is there's theories flying all over the place all the time we've got shooty gatwa who's uh, coming up i think that's starting filming that series in the next month or two so that's exciting stuff as well but uh, as far as this particular story goes look i'm i'm gonna just Lay it out on the line. If you haven't picked up previously when Philip and I have spoken, we're not the biggest fans of this era. There's nothing wrong with anyone that does enjoy this era. So I will be honest and say, no, I haven't enjoyed this. I did give it a good a good run, though, Philip. I did get to a certain point where I said, right, enough's enough. I can't handle all this. Uh, and I sort of lost the plot with it. Um, we've got some interesting guest appearances coming up in this one. We've got Sophie Aldred that we know about. We've got uh, Janet Fielding that we know about. We've got Gemma Redgrave that we know about. Sasha Dewan as the master. So I don't, any predictions on the regeneration? We know that there's going to be something a little different about the regeneration. What do you think might happen? How any theories? Know, how do we know there'll be something a little different? Well, that's that's the theory that's out there. Oh, see, I, I don't because we've got we've got David Tennant, we've got Shudi Gatwa, 
who is Jodie going to regenerate into? Is she going to regenerate into any doctor at all? Is it going to fade to to black like uh, some theories are out there? Is David Tennant going to be the 14th doctor? Uh, as is, some she theories open, are? is she going to open the watch that she hid in the TARDIS after spending six episodes trying to find? Yeah. And it's actually going to be David Tennant inside. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, there's a good theory. I don't, I, just, think I'd, I don't think I'd heard that one. Well, it's, 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 I still find it bizarre that she, you know, the entire point of Flux was her trying to find out who she was. Yeah. She finally gets the answer in the watch, and then she stuffs it down the TARDIS. Right. So are they, well, they may not come back to it all, but, yeah, that, you know, it, it's, it's the watch that David Tennant used all the time in terms of the, when he was, became human. Okay. So I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know. I've got no idea. I mean, I, I, I am hoping we're going to have three specials with David Tennant and, um, I was going to say Donna, that's not her name, of course. Catherine, uh, Catherine, Catherine Tate. Tate. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we'll, we will have, because there's a lot of talk about maybe three episodes. So and that so that's, so probably Christmas, they probably want Easter, and then the um, 60th anniversary, because I, I don't think the 60th anniversary will be su- 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 Um I think that's still going to be David Tennant. Mm-hmm. And then next, the year after will be when Suti's season starts. Mm. Interesting. So that's that's my prediction. I don't know. I, I, can I say? I mean, yeah, I'm going to name drop here. And yeah, having been chatting with Janet Fielding, she's very excited about the episode and the film that she did. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so she she thinks it's great. So I'm 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 curious. I mean, there's stuff that I mean, I you know, Tegan with a gun. She hates guns. I don't understand why she'd have a gun, mm. but it may all be explained in the plot. So yeah, I must admit. I, I wasn't aware there was on this Sunday. I have I have watched since you t- mentioned the promo to me recently. I have watched the promo, but I wasn't really paying attention. I mean, I I would have picked up that it was on, I guess, and so I guess we'll watch it Monday morning on iView or sometime yeah. during, during Monday. And of course, by the time you are watching or listening to this, uh, you would have watched it. It's all over. It's all over, Red Rover. So, even though I'm not a fan of this era. I've been thinking about some of the positive aspects of it that, and things that I've enjoyed throughout the era, certain things. And um, I'll, I'll tell you what they are. I'll give, you, I'll give you three things, if I can list three things. I think the cinematography and the quality of imagery that we've got throughout this uh, era has been exceptionally good. It's been beautiful to look at. My only criticism is that it hasn't had the stories to go with it. But cinematographically, if that's a word, um, it's a word I just made up. It has been stunning. It has been yeah. beautiful. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I don't. I don't think the show has ever looked better. I don't think they've ever used locations better. I think the way that they've graded the film is spectacular. Mm. And so, yeah, I, I fully agree. I don't. I don't think the show has ever looked better than it has looked under in this era. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one. Uh, the second thing that I have enjoyed. I do enjoy Sasha Dewan's master. I, I, I do enjoy uh, that character. Uh, once again, it hasn't really, he hasn't really been allowed to shine, I don't think, as far as stories go. But that's going to be interesting to see how the stories look that are coming up for him with Big Finish. Call me master or call me master in the in the northern accent. Uh, is So it's going to be interesting to see what that's, uh, that's like. I, I love him as an actor in other things that I've seen him in. I've always, I liked him as soon as I saw him playing Waris Hussain. I thought he was great in that. Yep. And uh, speaking of Sasha Dewan, he's in, he's in this one the, today. the set that we are going to be discussing soon. So, yeah, I, I think he was a great addition to this era. The other thing that I really love is the design of the Cybermen. I think, pers- for me personally, that 80s style but not 80s, they started off with inv- the invasion, uh, this particular design, and they sort of went back a little bit uh, in the early new series Cybermen, but these Cybermen are my favourite design Cybermen of the whole new series era since it came back in 2005. So I think that that is a, a, a excellent positive aspect of that, and if those Cybermen can be kept and worked on in the future uh, with that design, that would be great. I'd love to hear them speak. Uh, a bit more. I've really enjoyed it. There's three things, Philip. What about you? Anything? Uh, have you got any snaps in there? I guess maybe. Well, the... c- certainly in terms of looks, I, I think it is just so impressive how it looks. 
combined with that is in terms of, I think, the makeup. I think makeup and costuming, uh, as you mentioned, the Cybermen, I think the costuming and makeup has been superb. Well, the Sontarans of- were great too. The design of the Sontarans, yep. I think they were fantastic as well. Yeah, and, and even um, Tim Shaw, I mean, as much as he was an uncomfortable costume to look at with all those teeth, I mean, that was still an impressive costume. Hmm. Um, and, 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 and even the Flux, um, so those characters with the crystals coming out of them, that was a great makeup job. Mm, mm. So I, th- I think the makeup has been spectacular. I think it looks spectacular. Uh, you say, Sasha, I think a lot of the guest cast has been wonderful. They, they brought in amazing guest cast members, you know, sometimes too short to use, Stephen Fry. Um, but all the a lot of the guest cast have been spectacular. Kevin, and, Kevin McNally. Kevin McNally. And just, just doing an amazing, amazing work. For for me, the um, the main cast member has been Graham. As Bradley the, Walsh, yeah. Bradley Walsh has just been spectacular, and he managed to make lines that were pretty ordinary on the page sing, and he managed to bring in humour and pathos. And I think he was he he's done the best job in terms of all the main cast members. And so yeah, I missed him in the flux. And I, I I'm, is he going to be in this one? I'm hoping he's going to appear a bit. I I, I have heard rumours that he is in this a bit. So we'll just see with Bradley appears. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I know people love the era and people have enjoyed the stories. For me, I've just found too many plot holes and inconsistencies. And it's it's not like Doctor Who gets everything right because you know there's so many plot holes throughout all the classic era and all things. But usually, it makes enough sense internally, and it'll be something that is laughable. You know, I guess, Android Invasion, and then the main character wears an eye patch, and he's never looked under the eye patch to see he's actually got an eye there. I mean, that is just so stupid, it's ridiculous. Um, and so things like that did happen in the classic series all the time. To me, though, that it's just been consistently not enough attention being put together. And you know, listen, what reading through Chris Chibnall's interviews, he admitted the fact he didn't redraft things and that they weren't being checked by other people. And he didn't have a big plan and an overriding plan. And I think all those things show. So the, the, the things that he's admitted to, I think, have, have shown up and been a detriment to the program. But as you say, lots of people have loved it and good on them. If you've got joy out of it, I'm thrilled for you. Um, and I've still been able to get joy in Big Finish and joy in watching repeats of other things. And I'm looking forward to the new era and seeing what, what, what's to come. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, that'll do us for our rabbit hole topic. We'll climb out of it now. Here is a trailer for the story we are going to discuss for our Randomoids episode. Classic Doctors, New Monsters, Volume 1. Let's hope 19th century England is ready for the Jadoon. Coming soon from Big Finish Production. Michelangelo, who the blazes are you? Get back from the edge. What? Santa ha! Santa-ha! You've brought your fight into real time. Take your war, your cruel, senseless time war, and leave. You speak their language? Oh, yes. The cigarettes. What? Separate and ferment search. I'm the only chance you have. Doctor, the, the rain, he's trying to snuff out his torch. Keep your eyes on it. Don't even blink. This sector of space was contaminated by temporal flux. Why has security not reached that room? These blocks all around the, the angel could be anywhere. Give us the secrets of the humans. If you're a time lord, you can make things better. If you bring the time war here, they will have to live with the consequences. You may be able to control humans, but you will never understand them. Any moment now, the infamous doctor will be nothing but carbonized molecules. No, no, stop! Doctor Who. Classic Doctors. New Monsters. Volume 1. The Angel. I can't see it. I can't see anything. Big finish. We love stories. Gabby, I think it's coming. Joel? I love Joel. you. Okay, so there was a trailer for... What was that, Philip? <laughs> I, was <just laughs> <smiling. you> <laughs> I was just giving you a little smile and let you know I was ready to go. I just... <laughs> <laughs> you just started a bit earlier than I expected. <laughs> I was looking straight at the camera and I could see out of the corner of my eye these big teeth. There you go. Uh, well, I, if you go smile, show your teeth. That's what I always say. <laughs> Very good. All right. And only to be seen on our YouTube channel and uh, wherever you can see oh, our video. You're not going to cut all that out? <laughs> no, I'm, that's going in. It's oh, going great. in. Okay. So we're, we're talking uh, 
uh, Classic Doctors New Monsters Volume 1. Now, this was released in 2016. 16. So it's not that long ago, really, relatively speaking. It's six years. <laughs> but really, it's not, it's not that long. It's only one television era ago. Yes, Peter Capaldi was the Doctor. Yep. And uh, we had four stories uh, featuring the fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth Doctors. Back when we used to get four stories in a box set, big finish. Uh, we had uh, we four- still do some, yeah, some. Uh, Fallen Angels was uh, the fifth Doctor story, uh, featuring the Weeping Angels. We had Jadoon in Chains, featuring a uh, Jadoon. We had Harvest of the Cigarax, featuring guess what? Cigarax uh, would be my guess. And the seventh Doctor, and the eighth Doctor was meeting the Mara. new new monsters, Sontarans. <laughs> How'd that work? Well, it's classic doctors meeting new monsters. Sontarans, new? But it's the new versions of them. Yeah, and uh, I think they're referred to as Time War Sontarans. So yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, all right. Let's get a quick overview of the box set from you, Philip. What was your initial impressions of the, whole, of the thing as a whole? Oh, we're going to talk about it as a whole. I thought it was a brilliant concept, so I believe it was David Richardson's idea who came up with this idea. Um, and I, you've got to wonder why they didn't think about doing it before. It's, it became such an obvious thing to combine classic Doctors with new monsters. So when it was first announced, I was very excited by it. In terms of my first listen, it was brilliant. So I think this is one of the best things that came out that year, and it still stands at the test of time. I think it's possibly you know one of the best peter davison stories ever in this set certainly you know it's in his top five uh stories because i think that, that, that's very clever but all of them are amazing and yet they're not really by i was kind of yeah i was just gonna say they're not by the huge huge writers um oh, i guess james goss is andrew smith is no no ignore me totally paul morris is uh <laughs> phil maron's probably not um so yeah but in, in terms of i didn't i didn't know what to expect but I was certainly looking forward to it, and it does not disappoint at all. So what was your initial impression of the whole box set? Yeah, the whole box set, it was really good to hear. It got me thinking about the new series, and do we have many new series monsters that we can sort of interact with? They're very interesting selection of monsters. If you think about them, it's the ones that you can talk to. I can't think of any too many more than the um, Slitheen that you can have that sort of one-on-one conversation with, apart from the Sontarans, I guess, but they're sort of they're sort of new and classic monsters. It's interesting because we've got, in the last box set, we had Dream Crabs, which you don't really interact with. You've got um, the Silence coming up in the next uh, new monsters box set. you got the Vesta Nevada. And two Vesta, the... Yeah, which you don't really communicate with either. And here the opening story was the Weeping Angels. So... Let's talk about the individual stories. First up, we've got Fallen Angels featuring the Fifth Doctor. And here's the blurb. When sightseers Joel and Gabby Finch encounter a strange man in Edwardian cricketing garb in the Sistine Chapel, their honeymoon suddenly takes a terrifying turn. In 1511, Michelangelo is commissioned to create some very special sculptures by a mysterious sect. But as he carves, angels seem to emerge, fully formed from the rock almost as if they're alive. From Michelangelo's workshop to the catacombs of Rome, the fifth doctor must keep his wits about him and his eyes wide open as he confronts the weeping angels. There you go. And I was thinking about this. um, The weeping angels, you would think because they don't say much on screen that they are a visual monster. But if you actually think about particularly Blink, because they do start communicating in later episodes via various means, but in Blink, where they don't speak directly at all, when they actually move, you've got a very big audio uh, component of the fear factor of the Weeping Angels. And it's able to very easily be incorporated into the audio medium. So I think the Weeping Angels are perfect for audio. What do you think, Philip? Yeah, I, uh, the sound effects, well, I can say the sound design for this story is, spe- actually for the whole box set is spectacular, um, done by, actually it must be done by all different people, because I've got Howard Carter, Master Montague and Ian Meadows all listed, so I'm not actually sure 
who does the sound design for which story. Um, can I say, one of my big frustrations with these box sets, and this one in particular, is you just don't know which cast belong to which box sets and, you know, who's done what. So I think I mentioned that to Nick when he was on recently. That I think they really need to split out the box sets to actually list it's, separately. It, well, I can tell you on this one, it's Howard Carter. Okay. You know that for certain? Uh, I'm, first? I'm, because I've only... Oh, have I, I've got the box somewhere, but I only listened to the download. But it's on TARDIS Wiki. Ah, you're... Oh, I didn't think about looking at TARDIS. Well done. So the sound design, Howard Carter's sound design is just amazing, as is the music. And Howard Carter always does. And he's done the music for all of them. So the, yeah, the little shock stings he uses for the angels moving and the fear that they manage to put in the voices and the, the way that they can describe what is going on without making it too obvious which is, you know, just once again, the, the, the brilliant scripting done by um, Phil Malrin, it makes the whole thing work. And that opening scene where the two of them are together in the crypt, it is really quite terrifying. And those sound stings and the things happening, and you know what's coming on. I do wonder if you've not actually seen Blink, how effective it would be, whether it would lose its power. But for me, who can see what, visually see what's coming through the audio, Hmm. It's so powerful. I think it works really well. So I, yeah, I think that these are audio creatures, even though they don't speak. And you've got the image of the angel on the front in, like, in motion, virtually. Um, so their their freeze motion when they're about to attack. So yep. I think that uh, works really well. If you just look at the cover, you've got that visual there because that is described in the dialogue too. Hmm. Very interesting story. Very timey wimey. I struggle a bit with timey wimey in my old age, Philip. Uh, you know that. You poor so man. The, I love time. You it's, it's the one thing with the uh, Weeping Angels, because I've never quite understood how they can send people back in time to age to death, but then they can't go back if the doc, like the, even in this one, the doctor said he can't take them back. What's going to happen? What's going to happen if the doctor takes them back to their current time? Has that ever been explained anywhere? I don't no, think not, it has. Not really. I mean, yeah, I mean, the whole Rory and. Um... Amy, you know, as much as the TARDIS may not be able to land in New York because of all the time shifting that's gone on there, I, I, why can't he just land in Boston and catch a train down? <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. See, see Doctor Who has inconsistencies everywhere, so not just his era. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's not explained, but it's, it's you're given the, given the Doctor Who jargon that it, it can't work and he can't do it, and so, therefore, that's the situation. Got to suck it up and deal with the plot that's been given to you. So some of the cast in this one, we've got, as we mentioned, Sasha Dewan appears in this set, and this is the story he's in, playing the character of Joel Finch, just been married to uh, the other character, Gabby Finch, uh, played by Diane Morgan. So Sasha plays an excellent role, but Diane Morgan's voice I immediately recognised uh, because I've been watching on Netflix Afterlife with Ricky Gervais. Have you seen that series? I know, I know it exists, but no, I haven't seen it. You haven't seen it? Yeah, no. she's got a... Well, she's one of the stars of that of that series, so uh, her voice is very, very recognisable. It's the same voice she's got in that, and it's probably the similar voice that she's got in other things too that she's even more well known for. But I know her from Afterlife. So uh, this is the only big finish she's in, right? She's not been anything else. They're, they're, they're explained by the director. Guess who the director must be then? It's Barnaby Edwards. Barnaby Edwards, because the thing about Barnaby, one of the things I love about him is he draws from all the casts he works with. Yeah, and so you know, whenever he pulls together a cast, it's quite regular. The fact that they're not going to be in anything else because he's worked with them somewhere on stage. He pulls them in for production, and they, yeah, they don't. Sadly, often they don't get reused because some of them should be all the time because they're just amazing. Yeah, she's good. Interesting cast in Matthew Kelly. Now, I didn't hear all the extras for this set because for some reason my extras were playing up on my app. So I can only hear the extras for this one. And Matthew Kelly worked with Peter Davison in a series in the early 80s before uh, he took over as the fifth Doctor. So it was between all creatures and Doctor Who. Well, actually, yeah. it was at the same time. So the sitcom, and I forget what it's called now, but the sitcom he, they were both in, he was actually making it at the same time as Doctor Who. So he'd do Doctor Who and they'd be doing this, the sitcom at the same time. So they're actually on, both were on. Peter Davison was astounding in terms of how much he was on television at one stage in terms of running three, four, five different shows, you know, double banking stuff, because he was he was just so popular 
I mean, he's still popular. Peter, if you're listening, you're still popular, mate. Um, <laughs> but there was a he's time... never really slowed down, has he? He hasn't slowed down, and he, and he moves in stage in terms of musicals and things. So he's he's always had plenty of work. But at that particular time was really a high point in his career in terms of he was the hot property to get into sitcoms, into Doctor Who, into all kinds of things. And so he was just, yeah, working his little butt off. Mm. I was interested in... I, I just happened to look up a bit of information on Matthew Kelly. I don't really know much about him, but he's a he's a well-known um, compare on British television for all different shows. I think uh, Stars in Their Eyes, which is mentioned in the first series of uh, Doctor Who. But little stars. <laughs> um, so one thing I did pick up on, which which is sort of off topic a little bit, was that in 2003, Matthew Kelly was accused of some pretty serious crimes some child abuse crimes and he was really blasted in the in the media and taken to task and before anything was proved he was cleared of those crimes by the by the police not that long after a few months later but it sort of really blew up at the time and it was even raised in parliament um introducing some laws to to protect the anonymity of someone who's charged with something like this in case they get cleared. Now, I couldn't help but think, can you imagine if that happened today? How, Because there was no Twitter back then. Uh, imagine how it would it be today? Like he would have been cancelled and just, he would be, he, he, would, he would be destroyed today in today's world, which I think is uh, very, very sad, really. You, know, you look at people like Noel Clark who've been cleared of their... Uh, uh, allegations of wrongdoing so um yeah, it's a very a very different world that we live in now just a just a slight aside there off topic yeah mm. so but once again this is matthew kelly's only big finish as well mm -hmm. but he really was a bit of a star name to get in and you can understand he, he does a, an amazing performance as well now is it michelangelo or michelangelo i've always called him michelangelo my entire life it is michelangelo <laughs> they, they all call him michelangelo here well, maybe that's the English thing. English yeah. listeners, let's know. <laughs> so maybe, maybe it's Italian. Italian is Michelangelo, but yes, I've always said Michelangelo. But I'm Australian. I don't know how to speak. I'm, I'm prepared <laughs> to admit that. <laughs> uh, we've got Dan Starkey in there in a non Sontaran role as well, playing a priest as well, and even Come Barnaby. Come priests. Yeah, all Barnaby. the priests. Yeah, Barnaby Edwards is in there too, in a role as often the directors do, who are actors, get behind the microphone. So, yeah, I thought it was a, a really a really good story and uh, definitely well worth a listen. Okay, so next in the set, Philip, we have Jadoon in Chains, written by Paul Morris and Simon Barnard, who have done a lot of sort of Victorian era stuff, particularly with Jago and Lightfoot and... The Paternoster Gang. So they've done a lot of those. All right, here's a blurb for Jadoon in Chains. The Sixth Doctor is no stranger to courtroom drama, but faces a very different challenge when he prepares to defend a most unusual Jadoon. After an environmental clearance mission goes wrong, Captain Kaibo of the 19th Jadoon Interplanetary Force is stranded in Victorian England, bound in chains. An exhibit in a circus show. But he has allies. Eliza Jenkins, known to audiences as Thomasina Thumb, and the larger-than-life clown in the colourful coat. Uncovering a trail of injustice and corruption, the Doctor and Kaibo soon find themselves on trial for their lives. This, for me, Philip, is my favourite story of the set. It is so funny. It is so well done. So engaging. Um... It had me laughing out loud, but also had some serious messages as well within it. And I think this is the, the most well-rounded story of the set. Do you agree? I don't think you do, but... Um, no, you know, I, probably do, I probably do, actually, because it somehow Colin Baker always manages to pick up the best stories, always does he does the best preparation and just nails things better. But Colin, everything Colin does at Big Finish... You are, you are hard pressed to find anything that's a dud. So as I said, you know, the Peter Davison story is one of, I think, one of his best stories. 
it'd be up up there in the top five, top ten of my stories that he's done because I think it it works really well for him. It's got some lovely horror elements. It's got some lovely emotional stuff in terms of the couples. It's got some. It's it's got it's got a lot of interesting stories that happens and it really serves Peter well. But Colin just gets the best stuff all the time. And this is, as you said, this is really on the whole, it's a comedy script. But Colin manages to play different emotions all the time and he knows how to bring it back before the comedy happens again. And also because he's often the straight man with the bizarre stuff that's happening around him, it, it makes it all the the funnier. And and he lets other people shine. So he's just he's just an actor that's, you know, so much stuff is happening around him. And you, I guess there's, there'd be few doctors who could stand next to a Jadoon and not be able to swamp by them. And because there's so much interplay between Jadoon and Doctor, so, I mean, David, it was David Tennant who met them the first time. Um, he does actually have a lot to do with the Jadoon. He's basically running and they're sort of following and he has, hardly has any interaction with them. But because Colin is so big all the time, he can stand up to a monster that is so big, like the Jadoon. And there's scenes with both hit, both the captain and with, I forget what the other guys, what the other sometimes names that you're mainly following. Um, they can, he can play next to them perfectly and play as big as them when he needs to, but he can also be reflective and do poetry with them. And just, you know, okay, Captain just, Kaibo. Captain Kaibo. Kaibo, yes. Um, well, brilliantly, 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 brilliantly played by Nick Briggs. Oh, I was um, going to say that. This is unre- <laughs> sensational. Unrecognizable. But once again, Nick Briggs, he, he gets so much emotion to Kaibo and you feel for him. And, and he does this transition from lumbering brute non-thinker to poetic <laughs> sweet talker and romancer. Mm. And, and you do this journey. And, and Nick, Nick is actually able to take you on this huge journey with this character which is a to-do. I mean, it shouldn't be possible, but Nick manages to pull it off. And this is the kind of story that can only be done on audio. You could never get the kind of nuance in a Jadoon on screen that you can get with the voice, because you can imagine the facial expression. You, you don't have to see something that's animatronic. You know, the, the Jadoon on TV have animatronic mouths that, you know, and, and facial expressions that would look a bit silly uh, when they get too serious. I mean, they can be policey and shouty on screen. That's fine. But this is this is something that's so much more, th- you know, three-dimensional than any Jadoon will ever get on TV. I think this could only work on audio. And I think Paul and Simon are just, oh, I just, I just love their, co- their, their comedy just makes me laugh out loud. I was walking around my house doing housework and all, I would just burst out with laughter uh in in the middle of vacuuming you know my wife is probably thinking what are you what's the matter with you you weirdo yeah. uh but they are just so funny and i think is it is it paul that's the funny one i think it might be paul that puts in most of the jokes paul, uh, paul's, paul, paul's the comedy writer in terms of other professions and jobs. yeah yeah uh and it's just brilliant but combined with a really serious science fiction story which works really well. See, it all works well together. It's not just comedy. It's not yeah. uh, just science fiction. It just this is this is like perfection in yeah. this box set. And, and so, once again, it's it's making a strong point environmentally without ramming it home. I mean, you don't you don't it, it, you don't necessarily need to know that there's an environmental story undercurrent here. But when you actually examine the storyline, it's actually talking about the fact of how often and easy it is for rich people, rich companies to move into an area to just destroy an entire ecosystem without thinking about it for the sake of someone's 16th birthday party. Um, and this, so this, this is done on a big scale of terraforming a planet where there actually is a life form there. They know there's a life form there, but they don't care because they want to make profit. And we have in our world today, companies that are doing similar things. Now, it, it doesn't it doesn't harp on that it doesn't preach that you could you could almost ignore that whole storyline there but for those of us who are environmentally conscious you can actually go oh yeah look look at look at the point they're making in terms of money and in terms of not thinking about the environment and moving in and there's actually a whole heap of stuff that you could discuss there without it being rammed down your throat and i think when doctor who can actually touch on issues and ideas which are part of the story but not why the story is written it makes it more powerful. And so, yeah, so this is a lovely environmental bent. I love I love the characters. I love the come up that's happened to the, the company. 
and their immorality and the fact that there will be criminal consequences, which doesn't always happen today. But just the fact that, you know, you need to have consequences when you do the wrong thing. I mean, you know, we, we had a big mining government blow up um, a whole heap of Aboriginal caves um, with, you know, artwork thousands of years old telling all sorts of history knowing it was there but because they wanted to mine there and this was a, a hindrance to their minds and without any care whatsoever for history of of the first native people first nations people in australia without any thought about what we're going to lose in terms of that they just blew them all up and then wonder why they get us and they get slapped on the wrist with, with a little fine i mean to me the entire company should be closed down forever and disbanded but anyhow i'm getting off the point there that's all right. You can get off the point. I've got off the point too. I'm happy to preach, but I, I don't want my Doctor Who shows preaching at me and telling me what to think. And I don't think this does. That's right. There are other elements in there too, like exploitation. There's, um, you know, the whole uh, sideshow carnival aspect of it. And they're, and they're actually sort of right on that fine line of sending up the elephant man. Uh, because, they, you know, obviously Captain Kaibo's called the Rhinoceros Man and he's in the Sideshow yeah. Carnival. So they're sort of... Oh, when well, the dog gets locked up, I'm, I, I'm not an animal, I'm a Time Lord. That's right. <laughs> so, they're, so they're riffing on yep. a very serious uh, story to me, which is very close because I'm you know also a David Lynch fan, so I, I really like the Elephant Man film, but it's a very, very serious film and very heartbreaking film. And they kind of... I'm, I'm sort of thinking: Are they making? Are they making fun of it? Making light of it? But no, I, don't I, I, don't think, I don't think they were. I think they were very making a very serious point in terms of yeah. how human beings behave with a creature like a jadoon before he could speak English, and they were happy to exploit him, happy to use him. And so I think it's actually making a similar point. It's, doing, it's not doing it as darkly as the film The Elephant Man does, but there's actually mm. it's actually still quite black mm. and quite bleak. And, and you actually and, feel sad, and and just even that's the um I don't know what the character's name is, but after after the you know, the circus guy got killed, she sort of says, "Are we free now?" And this is the whole. Well, what do we do? How how do we handle freedom? What should we do? Well, I was going to bring up that exact point because the doctor says you can either uh, sell up and go off and i'm thinking what are they going to sell because they're the they're the circus what are they going to sell they've got the tents they've got the stores well, they've got the rides but rides they had rides in sideshow carnivals um, and they did because when, when the jadoon go on their little tour they stop and look at one of the rides rather than go on it and the doctor oh, okay. comment, the doctor makes fun of them because they won't go on the ride they'll just observe it yeah it observes rather participators yeah or, or they could manage themselves the doctor gave them that option said you can go and manage yourselves or or uh, get on so which which at that particular time in hi in in history that would have been a, a genuine quandary today like you know they could just go on welfare it's not it's totally different but then they would have had to think well what are we going to do to support ourselves so very very serious and and the the carnival owner was um jonathan jaggers esquire uh played by uh trevor cooper so he's you know from revelation of the daleks from star cops and uh yeah, many other big Finnish audios that he's been in playing guest roles such as this, where he's just perfect, perfect casting. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Barnaby Edwards. Yeah, he he always pulls together a great cast. Yeah, but this is my number one. Shall we have a little chat about Harvest of the Cigarettes? Yeah, can you do the blurb first. Yes, I will do the blurb first. Thank you very much. In the far future, humanity has a rem. Actually, you do the blurb. Go on, you do it. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> Harvest of the Cigarex. In the far future, humanity has a remedy for everything. Whatever the problem, Pharma Corps has the answer. And a designer's disease tailored to every human's blood type. Zanzibar hashtag has no need to be sad, scared, stressed, or depressed ever again. That is, until vicious aliens arrive on her space station, intent on opening its vault. What would it mean for the human race if the Cigarex take control of what's inside. And when the seventh doctor arrives on the scene, can he convince Zanzibar to care about her life long enough to help him? So what did you think of this story, Dwayne? Well, I couldn't help thinking of the biblical name in there, Shadrach. Yeah, and Zanzibar. <laughs> so if there was a story that I had to pick from the set that I liked the least, unusually, with for a James Goss script, because I usually think he's incredible, I didn't like this one as much, Philip. Really? Oh, yeah. I loved it still. 
And perhaps that's something to do with the fact that I I don't really like the Sycorax. I think I think they're pretty crap as a monster, to, to be honest. <laughs> I, I didn't like them really in the Christmas Invasion. They're, I mean, they're funny, and you know the Tenth Doctor works well with him. But as a as a as a Doctor Who monster, they don't really do anything for me. So I didn't like this one uh, as much, and. Uh, even though it had guest cast in there, like Jonathan Firth, who's Colin Firth's brother. I didn't know that. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was just something something lacking. They were dealing a lot with the... Because with the, um, obviously there's a, there's a bad guy in there trying to exploit and make money from the sale of humanity, basically. So it's a very, it's a very big con, this one. And there's a lot of... There's a lot of... Um, cynicism towards pharmaceutical companies and I was putting my mind back to the year 2016 because we hadn't been through the pandemic and you know we hadn't had the prospect of dealing with vaccines and things like that so I wonder if this story would be written in today's world Philip I actually think it would and even more so I think we are privileged living in Australia where our medications are relatively cheap and we have a government that's very, very, very heavily subsidizes our medical costs in terms of um, drugs and chemicals and things like this. So yeah, uh, I think our listeners in England and also in America, big, big pharma is a huge, huge issue in those places. Um, America at the moment is you know, part of the huge challenges in terms of how much medications cost and what they charge in the world. You know, we we got all the vaccines for free. We got all these things because our government just hands things over to us all the time. And we're very, very blessed that we have a free health system and a government that has maintained that you know, since Gough Whitlam brought it in decades and decades ago. And it's just assumed now. I think in other countries where pharmaceutical companies really exploit and, you know, once again, the, the, the HIV and AIDS and the, the medications that came out there, the drugs that came out there, and yet they were charging tens of thousands of dollars to people to keep them alive. We haven't experienced that. So I do think that people who, who live in other countries, under other health systems, would actually relate a lot better to this story because of what's going on with Big Pharma. So I think that's one, one element of it. That's... But this is a story where people are willingly submitting themselves to yep. drug-induced states. And I'm thinking, well, there's... So, so, there's so that's, that's the next element in terms yep. of us as human beings, how much are we using medications and self-medicating to deal with our problems? And that is certainly something that we're seeing happening more and more. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of you know, serious conditions and, and common conditions, ADHD being one at the moment. And as a teacher, um, the number of kids being medicated for ADHD towards the end of my teaching career, towards the, the beginning of my career was huge. Now, yeah. not saying that this, it's ADHD is a real thing that does affect lots of kids. And, and for some of them, medication is a major blessing, which allows them to think and function and perform at the levels they deserve to perform at. Yeah. There are other things that people should be doing with ADHD. There's, exactly. There's, that don't involve medication. That don't involve there's, medication. There's particularly in a learning environment. It's particularly in an environment. <laughs> and often, you know, Doctors are far too quick to just write out a prescription for a drug rather than actually take the time to help people. And I think we live in a society where we're always after the quick fix. And so we, we want the quick answer, the easy answer. We want the pill to pop. We want the quick surgery. We don't actually want to do the hard work to make the changes. And, you know, yes, people are suffering all sorts of things and, you know, depression and ADHD and all kinds of things that medication can help, but it's not the answer by itself. So, you know, depression and medication, important. But if you don't add to that counselling, exercise, diet, then they're just expecting the medication to do all the work for you is expecting too much. Yeah. So I think this story looks at the issue of a society which is totally reliant on every emotion being controlled by a drug. And so just what, what do I pop now? It's not popping, of course, it's, you're wired into the system. But you've got a system where you know, you're being monitored and every time you might be showing any sort of emotion, distress, sadness, pop a pill. And I do think there's a, there's a discussion that we need to have 
with people today because I think it's too easy to just want to pop pills and for our kids just give them the drugs to keep to shut them up and to move them on and so yeah I, th I think I think it's an important topic okay does it work in this story though not for me not not really not really there were there were some elements in there that were interesting like yeah, I think it may, it's the cigarettes that irritate me, Philip. That's the that's the main thing. I think I, I love just, the cigarettes. I, I was just in them. They're so funny, and <laughs> you think? Yeah, uh, I do. And you know, they've, they've, I mean, they've got a real purpose in being here in terms of they want to get access to the blood supplies because they they, they can do their special voodoo stuff with blood supplies. So it, what they're trying to do makes sense. Um, how well, they, they, don't, to... they don't really go into it much apart from the fact that they use it, but you know. They only want a slave race at the end of the day. That's what they're looking for. So there's there's not really much to them. I don't really see them as very interesting. I don't. I guess. Unlike crinoids, there's so much to a crinoid. Well, there is when they when they <laughs> symbiose with a human, like Keela. The Keela crinoid was fascinating. Oh, they just eat everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I think your expectations on um, dog two monsters might be a bit large sometimes, Dwayne. Oh, all right. Anyhow, yeah. I, I respect you. If you, you don't particularly like this story, that's okay. I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was, once again, perfect story for the Seventh Doctor. I don't think any other Doctor would have worked as well. I think the you know, Tenth Doctor, Seventh Doctor um, work really well. I do think the, the side characters worked well. I think it, it explored issues in terms of do you just let the company decide everything for you in terms of who you can fall in love with, who you can't fall in love with. Um, and it explores some issues in terms of our current society if we keep pushing the point of where we're heading to, what will it look like? Hmm. Um, I mean, the, the reason why I love the novel 1984 um, is the fact that when, when George Orwell wrote the book and it was published in 1948, reverse 84, 48, George Orwell wasn't predicting what the future was like. He was actually saying, this is what society is like today if we take the worst excesses. And so 94 wasn't a prediction of the future, it was a prediction of, it was actually a statement on society of his time and his world of 1948. Hmm. And I think something like this does the same thing. It's not a prediction of the future, it's a saying, this is where we are at the moment, this is where we're heading. This is, do we want these extremes to be part of us? And so I think it's a really good debate you could have in terms of what this story is trying to say in, in, in lots of other areas. I think it's very, very clever. And works at lots of different levels. Well, based on what you say, I'd give it another chance. So I'd recommend a, a re-listen for me yeah. and for anyone who hasn't heard it, a listen. Yeah. And we said we started to talk about the whole box. So the thing is, every story has a different feel to it. Mm. So, so you know, the first story is, is all about the terror and the fear of the of the angels. It's it's really quite you know, that's that's the big biggest terror one, scare one. Um, Dudun and Change is the comedy one. This is the body horror one. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the stuff in here is, you know, and the, the, the skulls and the, you know, the sc sculpture made of body parts and the, you know, hearing the bones hit the ground when, they, when they're killed by the cigarettes. So, now, speaking of sound design, yes, what, th there was a scene in there, that, which I listened to a couple of times, I couldn't work out, but it sounded like the Doctor was talking to the nucleus of the swarm. It had the same kind of sound effects that the do inside the Doctor's brain in The Invisible Enemy. Did you pick up on that? No, I didn't. He even he even put on a voice that sounded like uh, the Peter Tudnam Peter Tudnam, wasn't it? Who was the or was yeah, it John was. Leeson? I, I can't remember who it was that did the. I think it might have been John Leeson's voice. Peter Tudnam was in the prawn. Yes, <laughs> I forget now. But yes. oh no, it was John Scott Martin in the prawn. John Scott John, Martin's in the prawn. Yeah, John Leeson doing the the prawn, yep. the voice, but uh, it sounded just like that. So you didn't pick up on that. No. Do you know, who did who did the sound design for this one? Then do you know, can you tell them? Oh, this was Ian Meadows. Ian Meadows. Oh, okay. That's an yeah. interesting name to hear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, who did you do in Chains? Martin Montague. Okay. I don't know Martin Montague's work elsewhere. I mean, I could have, I could have a quick look and see what else he's done. Um, this, this, I did mention at the time, I meant to mention the scene where the Jadoon spaceship lands and all the troops disembark and they start marching towards the circus. The sound design for that entire... There's about two or three minutes of sound design, which is spectacular, and just told the entire story without any words needing to be said. Mm -hmm. And I just, that, that bit of sound design for that scene blew me away. Mm. Um, yeah, so I just thought it was, so, so who was that again, did you say? On this one? Yeah. Uh, on, on, on the, on the um, that was, Ma uh, Jadoon one was Martin Montague. Martin Montague. 
Well, yeah. well done. Can I say, Martin Montague, well done. Great <laughs> job. He's done lots of Blake 7, Star Cops. He's done quite a bit, actually. Towards so towards Star Cops, Blake 7, lots of action. Yeah, yes, actually. I'm just having a quick look at what he's done. Omega Factor. Yeah, actually, lots of Blake 7. Yep, yeah, okay. Interesting. Must I must look into a bit more to his stuff because I was so impressed by that. All right. Let's move on to the final story in the set, which is... Have we gone... Uh, are we still in within our half an hour, Philip? No, we're not. <laughs> well, we tried. No, we didn't really try at all. All right. The ordeal... Is it the Sontaran called? ordeal, the, son, the, the Sontaran ordeal. Let me do a, uh, read the blurb. An instant of the time war brings centuries of conflict to the planet Dracus, and the Eighth Doctor is there to witness the terrible results. A Sontaran fleet, desperate to join the epic conflict, follows in its wake to take advantage of the fallout. But when Commander Jask is beamed down to the ravaged surface, there is more to his arrival than first appears. Soon, an unlikely champion joins forces with the Time Lord to fight for the future of her world, and together, they must face the Sontaran ordeal. So, I guess with this story, the performance i was looking forward to the most she's on the cover it's josette simon yes yeah, spectacular. was this the first time she worked for big finish or she's been with them uh, once or twice before so this is the first time she's worked for big finish okay so uh, what did you think when you heard that voice coming through your ears i was so excited to hear dana <laughs> <laughs> um, it's good isn't it <laughs> G G josette simon is an amazing actress um in fact, it, yeah, pro probably in terms of all the actors who appeared in lead roles in Blake 7, Josette Simons is the one who's gone on with the most stellar career and classic career um, in terms of quality acting. Stephen Pacey, lots and lots of work. He's a very reliable. Um, you know, I love what he does. Um, Paul Darrow, of course, well-known, famous, but he's always Avon. <laughs> um, Josette Simon, though, in terms of classical theatre and classical television, is probably... Yeah, she's the Glenn Close of the, the, that Blake 7 crew. So I've always adored her. And I think it's tragically sad she hasn't returned to Blake 7. And, mm. you know, she's done that for her own reasons. And we, we've had conversations, not all, we've broadcast um, with different <laughs> <laughs> cast members about why she hasn't come back. Um, but to hear her and to hear her playing this strong but vulnerable character, um, to me, yeah, her... It's yeah. She really lifts the whole story hugely by this, this one bit of casting. What did you think? Yeah, it's different, isn't it? Because you see her in that uh, sort of warrior's outfit, and you expect you expect this really, really strong Dana type character, but she's she's quite different. She's a mother. Quite, yeah. She's a, li she's a librarian or something. I forget what a something like that. I think she's a librarian and a mother. Mm. Just yeah. she's, de she's just desperate to get her sons back, so she's prepared to risk her life because that's what parents do for their kids and of course this story is perfect for the eighth doctor because the eighth doctor was in, involved with the early part of the time war and it's interesting that sontaras aren't dealing with time war fallout well it is time war fallout but they're trying to find a way to get into it they just want to have a big barney and and start fighting the time war too yeah they don't care which side they're on they just want to be able to get in and <laughs> start want to fighting. Fight. so i think that's a great idea from andrew smith fantastic Big Finish writer. It was about this time that he started writing more and more, wasn't it? It was. This uh, this is actually maybe the first time the Time Wars entered into Big Finish. I'm not sure we had any Time War stories, did we? Before this, I I'm not sure. My um, my, my impression is this is actually the first time Big Finish started to touch in, in the Time War, and so this is you know this is very much a Time War story. Yeah. Um. And it works really well for that reason. So I'm just typing in War Doctor. 2016, October, after this. Um, oh, no, that's number three. Actually, no, so, okay, so the War Doctor w would have been started by before now. Mm -hmm. um, so th so they were starting to touch on, on the the, the um, Time War. But the, but, so, but the Eighth Doctor Time War series hadn't, hadn't started, started yet. yet. No. Yeah. And this, this really shows its potential. It, it has some harkbacks to The Night of the Doctor, because you know, Paul McGann appeared on TV in 2013 for the 50th anniversary, and they'd done that 10-minute, brilliant, brilliant um, Night of the Doctor. 
and certainly the reaction to the woman at the beginning of that night of the doctor where he she you know basically she kills her and kills him because she hates the time Lord so much you get a flair of that in the performance much as it's silent it's certainly towards the end at the end absolutely it's, um, it's a bit heartbreaking actually for the eighth doctor it really is because it's almost like he's found a companion you could take with him and yep. he's, got, he's found a friend and she says no way Jose. yeah <laughs> because because it's a planet of total peace for millennia and now it's going to be a planet of total war because of being caught up in whatever whatever's had happened with these weapons a, a, a temporal flux a flux temporal yeah. flux yeah no a flux a flux <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's, it's just heartbreaking now Another thing I found really interesting about the Sontarans in this was Dan Starkey's portrayal of Jask. Uh, because normally Dan Starkey plays a comic Sontaran. Which he often th does. Not normally? I think uh, it's normally. It is normally? Well, he's play he, when he, whenever he plays Strax, Strax is a, Strax is a, is is a comedy Sontaran. Yeah. Yep. But this was much more, much more serious, and it was it was nice to get that. I think my point is that this was a much more serious portrayal of a Sontaran for, than Dan Starkey normally plays, to me, to my mind. Uh, because the last great Sontaran story, to me, I think was actually called the last great, or was it called the great? No, it was called the well, Great Sontaran War. It was a Torchwood story. Torchwood, but that's co I mean, that's comedy too. That was comedy. So the last Sontaran isn't comedy. That's still Dan Starkey. Yeah. So, so there's, there's lots of stories where he, where he's playing a straighter, straighter one. To me, what, you just what, want to be very argumentative with me I today. I do want to be argumentative. Yes, I mean, that's con good. I think con that's controversy. Good. It's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> people <laughs> fight, enjoy fight, watching fight. people argue. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, to me, to one of the highlights, this was bringing back Christopher Ryan. Oh yes, of course. So yeah, yeah for, well, Christopher Ryan, who of course played the, reintroduced the Sontarans to us back in the Sontarans stratagem. Back in David Tennant's time with Martha and Donna, um, so Christopher Ryan's back, and of course yeah, I love Christopher Ryan from the Young Ones. Are you, are you too young for the Young Ones? No, you... no, no, okay. not quite that young. I know, I know, you're, you're a couple of years younger than me, but there you go. Um, so Christopher Ryan also does an amazing performance, and, and the two of them together. So it was good that they didn't just get Dan Starkey to do all the Sontaran roles, which they often do, good to them to save money, but having Christopher Ryan come back. Um, and the contrast between those two characters was really fascinating and really well done. And, they, and I said, so, and then with the, the Doctor having just a Simon as his companion, you had a lovely trio there of, you know, Dan Starkey, yeah, you know, and the, the other two. So, mm, love that. So another lovely science fiction concept that was woven into this. So it's not a straight Sontaran story. There's something. A little bit more unusual about it, and uh, the Christopher Ryan Sontaran ends up uh, being a crook, uh, which is very interesting as well. You don't get too many Sontaran crooks, do you? Do, do, what do you mean by crook? He's very dishonourable. He says he says he's dishonourable. I mean, it, that's it, that's virtually that's a criminal. Oh, um, I guess in Sontaran times it is. I mean, the, the whole the, I mean, once again the underlying. Theme. And what's the, this, this is very clever because there's lots of underlying stuff. The under, underlying theme here is in terms of is victory worth any price? And so, you know, they've developed a technology that will assure them victory, but the process of which will be the, the death of tens of thousands of their own troops. But who cares about that if you get the victory? Mm. And so it's the, the whole way of, you know, how much does the end justify the means? And is victory worth any cost? And at the moment, looking at Russia um, and Ukraine, this is certainly a question that's on all our minds at the moment in terms of, you know, what is the what is the final cost and what is the price of peace, and you know, what's the solution for what is a truly messy situation, and this is one of those issues in terms of you know, how do you deal with this situation and make it work or not work. You're relating a lot of our stories to a current world tonight, uh, Philip, aren't you? I think good stories, it's good storytelling, you can always find undercurrents of themes and they keep having meaning into the future. Mm. And that's why classic stories like Frankenstein, um, you know, all those horror stories of Dracula, um, but be it, be it more, you know, 19, 1984, all good literature speaks to every generation and, and continues to speak to generations. 
And if it's, if it's not good, it doesn't move, it doesn't live on. It doesn't speak. The reason why I think this box set is so good is that it still speaks today in a slightly different voice to what it would have spoken to when it came out in 2016. And I believe in another 10 years time, we could, if we're still around and doing this, you could actually look at it again and there'll, be, there'll actually be, the themes will have a new meaning and a new connection. Yeah. Because that's what good stories do. And, and that's why you know whether it's a good story or not in terms of, well, what can I get out of it? What, what, what depth is there in this? And you know, how, how we managed to get four stories all with great depth um, in different tonal styles, because they're all quite different in terms of tonal styles, and yet different doctors, different monsters, but with messages that are relevant back then and relevant today. And that's that, yeah, that's why I think this is, guys, if you've not listened to this box set, get it because there's so much in it. Mm. And and the next two boxes are good, um, but to my mind, they're not as good as this first one. Um, but I, once again, I need to have another listen to two and three just to be sure of that. But yeah, every every note of this is just perfect. The castings, the direction, the soundscape, the music, the pairings the, of the doctors with the monsters. pairings of the doctors with monsters are so carefully thought through. Um, I guess they had the freedom to because the, it was the first choice they had, and they they must struggle with the pairings. I mean, you, you mentioned the Slitheen, that you can't have the Slitheen with classic doctors because you know that it's the first time he'd met them, because you know, you know Christopher Eccleston didn't know who they were, didn't know whether you know he f- figured it all out, but he didn't know Slitheen was a family, not a race, mm. and so they can't have met beforehand, mm. and so you really are limited, amazingly limited by which creatures you can actually put back. And so this was their first set. They had the freedom of anyone at all. And, and you can, it's a bit of a fudge with Sontarans. Let's face it, it is a bit of a fudge. But they are very definitely modern series, Sontarans, not classic series. Mm. But yeah, it, it, it all just works. Absolutely. Just one bit of trivia uh, on the last story. The character Jask, uh, played by Dan Starkey, is the name of the character that shoots at... The Tenth Doctor in the End of Time. Did you know that Sontaran was called Jask as well? And Martha and uh, Mickey saved no, the Doctor? No, I hadn't realised that there was the same name. Just a bit of trivia I just spotted on well, TARDIS Wiki. Thank you, TARDIS Wiki. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Thank you, Roddy McDougall, for that uh, pick. It was great, uh, as you could, could hear, uh, for us to, to review that. And I hope you enjoyed our discussion on it. And everyone, in fact, I hope you enjoyed our discussion on that. That only leaves us time to pick the next couple of stories for our next instalment of... We've got randomoids. So, I think it might be time to log into the Randomoid Selectatron, and I will pick a couple of stories. The first ones that pop up, Philip. Yeah, it always is, of course. Here we go. First one. Okay, Philip, the first one is Doctor Who, The Lost Stories, The Second Doctor, and it is Prison in Space. Oh, okay. That is good. I mean, I don't think it is good, but I've been, I've been, <laughs> wanting, de- <laughs> I've been wanting to re-listen to this. It's quite bad, but yeah, I think I- it's so bad, it's very interesting to listen to. So we'll I, listen I to that really want to... I- I don't think I listened to the whole thing through. I'm pretty sure I got about halfway through it and didn't finish it. Well, so, you've got that. And there's that Dalek story as the bonus on that set as well. What Dalek story? Uh, <laughs> that shows I know nothing about this. There, there is a, the, the, you remember the Dalek series that was going to be produced in America? I think it's called Curse of the Daleks, I think. Oh, it's yeah. The, the first story where Mark Seven appears. They've That's on that set. Oh, is it? I hadn't realized that. Okay. I, I've, okay. Yeah, so that's definitely worth a listen to if you if you get a chance. But okay, well, I probably will. We don't we don't have well we may as well talk about that uh, as well. But we'll listen to that and one other. And the second one you're pulling up is Doctor Who, The Companion Chronicles, The Perpetual Bond. Oh, okay, fantastic. Now that's part of a trilogy, isn't it? Which it is. It where is, is, is fir- that? It is the first one. In oh, the good, 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 good. So. I think I have heard that one before because I started on the trilogy, but I haven't finished it. So that might get me into gear to finish that trilogy. I so, listened to quite, well. I think I listened to it in preparation for our interview with Peter. 
Peter Purvis. Right. So I, I listened to it fairly recently um, in preparation for that. Very good. So there are our two stories for the next installment of uh, We've Got Randomoids. So uh, looking forward to that. Now, we've recommended the box set. It's time to recommend something else. And Philip, what have you been listening to that you can recommend to us? Because as always, it's your turn. I know, I'm just so selfish. Um, I'm going to recommend an audiobook from Big Finish, which came out recently. Um, the Terra Nostra, Zero Point. So I'm not sure if people have been listening to the new Blake 7 box sets. They've been pretty amazing. And the Terra Nostra one was a lot of fun and a bit of clever... Um, I don't want to spoil things. There's some lovely appearances by characters in it that you may not expect. But yeah, so I, I, yeah, I think people know. Huge, huge Black 7 fan. Love it. And I'm loving the fact that they've found ways to still use original cast members in very clever ways. Is it? Is it? Am I right in thinking it's the the Blake Seven episode Pressure Point? Is no, that, Shadow. Shadow. So if you watch Shadow, you can go virtually right. straight into this. Yeah. yeah. So and and what, what am I actually? What am I actually? Probably the first Blake Seven episode I watched several times was Shadow because a friend of mine recorded it, and I think I watched it three times in a row. So this is one of the ones that really got ingrained in my head early on because um, it's a great Cali episode. Um, Shadow is a drug, an abusive substance, which is very highly addictive and controlled by the Terra Nostra. And so the whole Shadow episode is all about this evil force, which appears to be in um, conflict with the Federation. And then you actually find out is actually part of the Federation. But the Federation not only hold the authority in the good side, they also hold the whole criminal underside as well, that where they have total power over everything. And so the Terra Nostra box set is all dealing with this organization and how they manipulate power. Um, so this, this, this is an audio book that links with that set. It's, um, Stephen Greif, who is the narrator and Stephen's voice is just magnificent. It's beautiful but, to listen to, isn't it? Yeah. Beautiful to listen to. So it's, it's written by Mark B. Oliver, who's done a bit of stuff for Big Finish in the past. Um, because it's an, it's an audio novel. Um, and it, it's actually one of the ones that's being brought out soon in the hardback. So I will actually buy this. There's, a, there's three of them that are being released as hardback. So I will be buying it because I just love books uh, for my book collection as well. But it's a very clever story. It, it deals with all, lots of normal tropes of Blake 7, Liberator in danger, crew have to split up for different missions. You've got another secret base and things happening in their Federation wise. And so you, you're, you're sort of jumping between three main locations. But there's always a lot of terror. There's a lot of really clear explanation, some lovely dialogue. Stephen Graff reads it really well. And I was engaged for the whole time. And you know, I had six and a half hours driving the other day. Um, and I spent a large part of it listening to the story and loved the conclusion. So excellent. if you like audiobooks, or even if you don't, it, this is probably a good one to actually try. And if you like Blake 7, you'll, you'll love it. What about you, Dwayne? What have you been listening to? What do you want to recommend? I have been listening to something on the Season 22 Blu-ray box set that I'd never heard before. I don't know if it was released when the DVDs were released, but I stumbled across an interview with Robert Holmes that was done for Doctor Who magazine. So it was an interviewer with a cassette recorder in 1985, about eight months before he passed away. So he finished The Two Doctors, and this is on The Two Doctors uh, disc, this second disc in the Blu-ray set. Um, and... It goes through, it's a it's a 90 minute interview with Robert Holmes. So you don't get to hear too much of Robert Holmes' voice in anything. Um, so this is a fascinating to listen to. I've, I've only listened to about half of it so far. I was just listening to it before we came on for this, Philip. But it's starting right back from the Crotons, talking about every story. Wow. Um, talking about uh, the five doctors, why he couldn't do it. Talking about the creation of the master. Uh, he, interesting comment that he made. He's he said, oh, I think the master needs to win a few. He's lost too many, which was really interesting because now we've got the master in his own or her own box sets as well with, with Big Finish, uh, who were their own hero. So maybe that's something that Robert Holmes was alluding to. The master needs to be more of a focal point in the stories. Uh, but it's absolutely fascinating to to listen to such a, a an in-depth 
uh, interview with Robert Holmes. Not the best quality. You've got to concentrate a bit at times to hear what's being said, but I, it's absolutely fascinating. And if it was released on the DVDs, great. Go and seek it out there, but it's on the Blu-rays. Okay, there you go. Hmm. That's my recommendation. Sounds great. All right, that'll do us for this time. Looking forward to what comes in the month of November. That's it. Boy, October went fast, Philip. Oh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's getting faster and faster. Yeah, it really is. All right. Thank you very much uh, for your company. And thank you for yours, Dwayne. And uh, thank you all for yours. We'll catch you next time. This has been the Sirens of Audio episode 131, Randomoids 14, featuring classic doctors, new monsters, with your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Original theme music composed by Joe Kramer. Our website is sirensofaudio.com. You can email us at sirensofaudio at gmail.com or contact us via any one of our socials. Thanks for listening, audiophiles. We'll hear you next time.